Uh, Lord willing, we will complete our study in uh, uh, the gospel uh, according to Luke, Jesus, the, the perfect man. Really, uh, everything in Luke, it says, well, everything in the word of God, it points to Jesus. But we see Jesus really highlighted as, as the perfect man, the, the, the ultimate man. And man, if you, it's not, <laughs> it's not the man that uh, you see on the, on the magazines, magazine covers are photoshopped, just like the women on the mag- magazine covers are all photoshopped, and, and you can read about the, the perfect man out there, or you can uh, see Hollywood, what Hollywood portrays as the perfect man. Jesus is the perfect man. Jesus is the perfect man. He's the one to follow. You know, we started this study, uh, four score and seven years now, we started, we started this study in Luke, <laughs> boy, I'll tell you, it sure feels like it, you know, <laughs> started this study in Luke a long, I had no idea the Lord was going to take me, let alone all of you, because if I go on the journey, y'all go on the journey with me, so I had no idea we were going to go on this journey uh, like this for so long, but praise God, it's, it's, it's been really, really cool. You can, uh, of course, listen to uh, all of the services uh, on Luke. I think there were, there's 80-some-odd uh, teachings on, on uh, the Gospel of Luke. You can uh, listen to them on the church website. Uh, personally, I think it's better to watch on YouTube. Um, but uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and, and watch on there, HLCFLV, for Harvard's Life Christian Fellowship Las Vegas. And you can watch all the services on there. And uh, you can get uh, a whole 80-some-odd uh, weeks' worth. Uh, of that, but uh, but anyhow, it's been a it's been a wonderful journey, and we're going to pick up where we left off on the two that uh, were on the road to Emmaus, and uh, ended up being joined by another. We know that that other they didn't realize at the time, they didn't recognize him for who he was. Afterwards, they do. We know from reading the Word of God that as they were on that journey, a seven mile journey um, from uh, 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 Jerusalem, there. Uh, to uh, Emmaus, that um, uh, Jesus ended up joining them there. And we were reading about that last night, and uh, uh, it happened the day that he rose. The day that he rose from the grave was the day that they were, were walking, taking this journey. They were walking and talking about the events and the things that had uh, transpired. And Jesus is there with them, but they didn't realize, they knew someone was there, they didn't realize that Jesus was, was Jesus. Um, they just didn't recognize him. Uh, for whom uh, he was at the time. But let's continue in verses 20. Uh, We're going to pick up here in verse 25 and read through verse 29 here for just a moment. It says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And by the way, uh, I, I don't know how else to say it, or how it's even going to come out, but, but man, I, I like to follow a winner, right? I like to follow someone that's, you know, when I was young, as a teenager, and I was interested in, in everything with money and investments and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, I went to a real estate convention at what was at the time the Aladdin Hotel, and I was like 16 years old and, and everything, and, and I thought, hey, if you, if you want to be successful, um, then, then follow others that are successful, right? Well, hey, there's no greater winner, so to speak, uh, than the Lord who conquered sin and death, conquered it all, and has brought us victory, the victory that we can have in Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, so there, uh, here he is, and, 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 and he suffered, and all these things, um, it says, and, and to enter into glory. And he's talking to them about these things, and he was sharing with them um, in the verses before that, from the Word of God and all the things that pertain to Him. And uh, uh, what a Bible study that must have been. Wow. Uh, Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Just incredible. Verse 28, And then they drew near to the village where they were going, and He indicated uh, that He would have gone uh, farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Wow, what, what a, 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 a trip. <laughs> uh, what a trip. Like, yeah, what a trip. To be with Jesus. And yet they didn't even recognize it yet. 
uh, recognize him at the time. But as we see in verses 28 and 29, Jesus would have walked beyond Emmaus. He was ready, he was prepared to just you know, keep on walking through, so to speak. But they persuaded him to remain with them. I like that. They persuaded him, not even knowing. Like here we are, we recognize, hey, this is Jesus. At, the t- at that moment, they didn't recognize that. And yet they were, they were seeking, they were searching. And, and Jesus was providing them answers and from, his, from the word. And, and they were intrigued. Remember, before Jesus joined them on that journey, they were talking about the things that were taking place, the things that had happened in those three days and, and everything. And so they were interested. There was conversation. There was, there was seeking. And Jesus is there with them. And Jesus is expounding from the word. And man, they're hungry and thirsty for more of it. They're like, wow, this is incredible. It's, it's, I, I kind of view it like, like the light came on for them. What a wonderful and incredible moment. And then they reach their destiny, and, and, you know, and they're like, wait a minute, no, no, stay with us. Stay with us, don't, don't go on. Stay with us overnight, or stay with us for, for the time being, or whatever it might be. And, but not only did they persuade him to remain with them, but it makes me think to myself, how Jesus won't force himself on you. You know, maybe you've thought that, that you know, we all think all these different things. And, and uh, you know, why, why doesn't Jesus just make everyone follow him? Well, you can't enforce love. You can't mandate love. I will make you love me, you know. I, I mean, you can't do it. Love that is forced is... Love that is coerced, and it's not true love, you see? It's robotic. It's not natural. It's not from the heart. It's not the decision of the individual. We choose to dis- and we decide to, to follow Jesus or not, to love him, to walk in his ways or, or, or not. Jesus won't force himself on you, but he certainly does want you in his life. He wants you. He wants us to be with him. But we need to want him. We need to want the Lord. Those who end up in eternal hell are those who reject the only one who will save them from it. Again, those who enter into hell, those who go to eternal hell, are those who reject the only one who can or will save them from it. It really is their own decision. Why do they want him to abide and, and to stay longer? Well, again, we see in verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He explained the word to them. Guys, we got, we got to get this here. I say this all the time because, uh, unfortunately, this is an unfortunate part of the culture that we are in today. Uh, you know, this isn't our, our great, you know, grandmother's uh, America anymore, okay? Or our grandparents' America anymore, where people came to church and you expect to hear the word. It's like when I go to 7-Eleven, you better have a Coca-Cola Slurpee for me. 7-Elevens are for Slurpees, man. Okay? It's just how it goes. You know, I don't, you don't have a Slurpee. I mean, if there's no Slurpee at 7-Eleven, then they might as well just, you know, get rid of 7-Eleven. Okay? It's worthless. But you know what, though? The church is worthless without two things. You know what they are? Without the Holy Spirit... The church is worthless. We have no power, okay? And without the written word of God, without the written word that tells us of the Lord, and without the Holy Spirit that empowers us in God, church is worthless. And yet churches today are filling up. Some churches fill up like, like, you know, there's no tomorrow, but the word isn't taught and the power isn't there. People are coming and and people are going. They came as they were. They stayed as they they came as they are. they, They stayed as they were. There's no change, but there's excitement. It's a fun time. They had an experience. Experience has trumped biblical doctrine. We don't teach doctrine in churches today. We teach how to be a better you. We teach psychobabble. We teach fun stories and interesting things. And, and people walk away and say, that was a wonderful experience. And you know what? I will say this. It may have been a wonderful experience, but it wasn't a Christian experience. It may have been a wonderful experience, but it was not, it was not 
the Word of God. It was not a biblical church with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And God is saving for Himself a remnant today. And that remnant will be raptured when the Lord calls us up, when He raptures His saints, when He raptures His people. And He has saved for Himself this remnant. So He explained the Word to them. He expounded on the Word. It's the Word of God. And we need it. You're here this morning because you want it. And he expounds to them from, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, from Isaiah to, Ma- to Malachi. The Word came alive for them. <laughs> Literally, the Word, Jesus Christ, the living Word was alive for them and with them. They got the Word and the Word. I, 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 just, I, I, I can't begin to really fathom what a moment What privilege this was for these two. Just amazing. And it's like when you're really, you know, uh, seeking, really, really wanting answers and, uh, you know, really wanting the, the truth about God and eternity and His plan for your life and you're hungry for it. You're hungry for it. I was so hungry for it. I'm still hungry for it, but I was so hungry for it as a teenager in my late teens. And I didn't know the Lord. I just knew that life was pretty jacked up. And I knew that I was pretty jacked up. And I thought, wow, is this, is this God's purpose in life? Is this why I'm here? Because if this is why I'm here, then why not check out? You know, because I thought life stunk. Honestly, I really thought life stunk. I'd seen enough, heard enough, experienced enough, and I didn't like it. But God used it. Praise God for the difficulties in my life. Honest to goodness, man. Praise God for the awful things that I had to experience growing up. Pretty bad. Because God used it to like knock some sense into this stupid teenager and get his attention. And if everything was hunky-dory in my life, then you know what? I may never have called out to the Lord. And so I can look how God used those things. Praise God. And I am thankful for what came of all of that. Hungry, thirsty, wanting more. Forget that it's been a stressful past three days for these men. You all know all the things that we've been reading about in the previous week. Past, past, very stressful past three days. But these men were involved in Jerusalem at that time. Mixed with a very long journey, on foot, seven miles, on foot, stressful previous three days. They were likely hungry from this journey. It's later in the day. They're wanting to rest. But oh, Scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. What does that mean? But to partake of the Lord. When you taste, you see. When you partake of Him, then you really recognize and realize, oh, how good it is. How good He is. And how much you and I have missed out before Christ was in our life. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's Scripture that declares Him you and to me and so they wanted more they wanted more we see that indicated in the in the statement here they constrained him he said abide with us stay with us here don't go don't go further we want more we want to hear more we want to know they were hungering and thirsting for righteousness when you hunger and thirst for righteousness you know what you get jesus i'm telling you When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you get Jesus. When our hearts are in the right place and we want Him to stay with us and and instruct us, man, let's stay. But He won't force Himself. Because then it's not real on our end. John chapter 4, verses 39 and 40. It says, and many of the Samaritans of that city, remember when we were reading about the woman of the, at the well, and Jesus comes to the well, and you know that whole story, 
And then he's there at the well, and she's uh, blown away by everything that, that he had said, things that he knew about her that couldn't have been known any other way. And she goes back into the town, into the community, and she starts telling him, like, wow, I, I spoke to a man who knows everything about me, everything I've ever done, and, and all this kind of stuff. And she starts telling them, talking to them, and they were absolutely intrigued And it says that many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. He got her attention and used her, got their attention. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, so they were like, well, wait a minute. You came to us from him. Now we want to go to him from you. They were intrigued. They're like, wow, this is great. They had come to him and they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there too days. Wow. So they urged him to stay. They wanted more. They urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. John chapter 15, verse 4. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Try it. You got a fruit tree? <laughs> Cut off a branch. See if that branch survives on its own. It's not going to survive. We survive when we're connected to the Lord. We don't survive when we're not connected to the Lord. We're walking around aimlessly. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. I... I, I think the key word there for me, uh, we could say the key word is abide, but, but uh, maybe secondary to that would be let. Let. It sticks out like a sore thumb to me. Let. Let that abide in you. Let what abide in you? Let Christ abide in you. All you got to do is, hey, hey, we all heard the cliche uh, many years ago, and everyone, you know, everyone had the, you know, what would Jesus do things, you know, uh, uh, bracelets and and all of that kind of stuff, and then the whole let go and let God, right? But man, you just got to let God. You just got to let the Lord, man. You just got to let him have his way in your life. Just let go of your plans, your will, your agenda. Say, thy will, not my, or, thy will, not my will, be done. So you see, one may be by Jesus, they were by Jesus on that journey, right? He was walking with them, talking with them. Jesus is there and by him. One may be around Jesus. One may be in the vicinity of Jesus. One may hear of Jesus or even frequent Jesus, so to speak. But to abide with him, to want more of him is the key to Christian growth. It's the key to growing in a true and living, walking relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. This isn't religion. If you're here for religion today, walk, walk out. I'm dead serious. If you're here for religion, you're in the wrong place. You, you, you can leave right now. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about an abiding relationship, the most fantastic, incredible relationship that is known to man. It's the relationship that you were created for. It's relationship with the Lord. That is why we come is to learn more of him to worship him together to seek him together i want more you know remember romans 10 uh, 17 it said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god and so in this church if we want to increase in faith we got to hear. And if we're going to hear, it's not that we're going to hear by this cool story and that cool story. We're going to hear by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that will change our lives. If there's five of us, if there's one of us, if there's two of us, somebody else beside me would be great. If If there's two of us in this church and we hear and by hearing, we have faith in Him and we love the Lord and we serve the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Two are better than 20,000 if they're not walking with the Lord. You got got what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Hmm. Let's look at verses 30 and 31. 
Now it came to pass as he, as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. They sat down to eat with the Lord. They sat down to eat with the Lord and you know, I mean, dinner is such an intimate time, really. Dinner time is such a cool time. You know, I mean, we go out to dinner with a friend or, you know, go out to lunch with a friend or whatever or, or with family or, or we have someone at our house and we go to someone's house and you sit down around a table and you, and you talk and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, it, and especially back in the day, you know, when kind of working more of the nine to five-ish kind of thing or whatever, um, was maybe a little bit more more common and and families would sit down and friends sit down and you and you just have that dinner that that supper together it's really a very intimate very close time of 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 uh, fellowship you know surrounded by friends family a meal it says that their eyes were opened their eyes were opened perhaps it was the way that he blessed the food that all of a sudden, the, the light came on or whatever, and they just recognized, wait a minute, this is Jesus. Why? <laughs> you know? I, I don't know. But I think it's interesting that it happened at the dinner table. Their eyes were open. Their faculty of knowledge, you know, uh, they, they knew about him. They knew about him previously, you know. But now... They're beginning to understand. Now the light's coming on. Now it's coming together. He became clear to him or to them. What amazement for them this must have been. How incredible and how fantastic. What a <laughs> you know, we sing a song. Perhaps you've heard it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And it's a great song. I love the song. One of those songs, you, you know, you just really just draw near to God, the Lord, and that open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. May we pray that he opens the eyes, so to speak, of our heart. May we pray that, that, that we get it. That we really get all of him. It's life-changing, isn't it? Like my life is, 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 is totally different than it was, than it would have been because of Jesus. And that's a praise the Lord, good different, amazing different, great different. Wouldn't want to go back. It's wonderful. It's life-changing. I want more, and I think you want more, and when you seek, you find. Well, I'm a Christian already. I know the Lord. Yeah, well, you still got to seek. You got to keep on seeking. I've, been, I've known the Lord for 30 some odd years and I still keep on seeking him. I still keep on uh, studying in his word and I'm still learning and growing so much. In fact, I kind of feel, sometimes it feels like the, the more I learn, the more I recognize that I don't know, you know, because his word is so, so deep. You can't exhaust the word of God in your life. So verses 32 uh, through 35, it says, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were uh, with them gathered there, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now they're saying that. And they're saying this in the presence there. It says the 11 there. In other words, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Like, in other words, what they're saying is it really did happen. He really did appear to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was, there's that word again, known to them in the breaking of bread. Again, I just think that's so cool. The first thing they did is or the first thing they did, rather, after their eyes uh, were, were being opened by Jesus and, 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 and uh, the proof of his resurrection and everything, was to tell others. The first thing they did was to tell others. The first thing they did was to witness of the good news. Witness of the good news. 
They got moving. They got moving. They did something. They opened their mouths. No closet Christianity here. No closet Christians. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know anything about the Bible. They didn't. What did they know? I mean, I mean, he was sharing with them on that walk that day. But I mean, you know, talk about newbies in the Lord. Okay. <laughs> but what? Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Right. And they can speak of the Lord and speak of his love. and They can speak of of what they what they they knew. Little as it may have been at that point, short <laughs> hours, a uh, bit of time in, in knowing the Lord. But they went to share. They were excited by this. And they recognized they had a message. If you've got Jesus in your life, you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart, man, you've got a message. You've got something to say. You've got something to say that's of value. We all have something to say. But you've got something to say that's life-changing. You've got something to say that's of value. They didn't keep their mouths closed. They opened their mouths. After all, what else is there to talk about compared to this? They realize that there is hope. That there is hope. And this is a game changer. And this is a life changer. You know, we can talk about so many things, and we do. We may talk about a career change. We might talk about you know, some great windfall that has uh, happened in our lives. We may talk about the birth of a new baby in our family. And all cool things. And not to say that we shouldn't share about the things that go on in our lives. Share about the golden nights. Who doesn't like the golden nights? You don't like the golden nights, does it? No. <laughs> share about the golden nights, you know? That's cool. But man, golden nights won't change your life. And that promotion won't change your life. And that more money and that bigger home or that meal on the table or that baby boy or baby girl or whatever it might be, it's, it's not going to change your life like this. Not eternally. It's a game changer. Jesus is risen. And they had to go. He's risen indeed. Yeah, amen. Amen. Verse 35, you see that word there, known? And uh, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. He was known to them. Known. Listen, he was known to them. This is a deeper word in the Greek than the one that was in verse 31. You know, in verse 31, I'm not going to get into the Greek word there. It says they, they knew him. Here in this verse, in verse 35, known. And you think knew, known, same thing, you know. No, actually, it's a different word in the Greek. And right here, the word um, in the Greek, this word is gnosko, a word that speaks of an experiential understanding. An experiential understanding. To be very honest and, and, and open uh, with you all, literally... As I was studying on this, it said that it's a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. And you know what? I think it's really cool to, to share that because you, you see that there's one knowing when you're, you, you, you meet that guy, you meet that gal, you're talking with them, whatever. There's another knowing when um, you're, you're uh, you know, dating or, or whatever it might be or, or engaged. Then there's another knowing when you enter into the marriage relationship, you see? It's a different knowing. And you can't say, well, I, I know him, I knew him, I knew him, I knew her, I knew her. It, it, it's different. It's different. Even the word in the Greek is different. They, they knew from experience, so to speak. Someone can hear about that, this or that, but so experience is another thing, you know, like a roller coaster. You know, there's some pretty cool roller coasters out there. And you can, you can be there in an amusement park and you can watch that roller coaster and it's, you know, they got these ones where people are hanging. I don't know about the hanging thing, you know. It's enough to get me on a roller coaster. A few years ago, 
<laughs> you're, I know, you're all probably going to say another name in a roller coaster. It was at um, uh, was a SeaWorld, and they got a roller coaster. And that thing was going fast and twisting and turning, all these crazy things and everything. And I was going to go on it, and Kathy just didn't, didn't want to go at the time. And I was going to go, and I'm like, nah, and I got, I got yellow. And, you know, and, and, <laughs> and then there's this, honest to goodness, this woman, she must have been like 105. She's, she's sitting on the bench right there. I'm not kidding you. I'm like dead, I mean, seriously, you know. And she's like, oh, come on, honey, I'm going to go on that ride, come on. And now I'm being, you know, shamed by this, you know, 105-year-old. And I'm like, oh, well, great. You know, now I'm going to really look bad, not only to this woman, but to anyone walking around hearing, to my wife. So it's, and I'm just like, oh, well, you, you know, you go, you enjoy it. No, no, come on, honey. You know, I'm like, great, great. You know, and here's this old woman, you know, the roller coaster, everything. And I'm just like, you know, white knuckled on this thing and everything. You know, I experienced the roller coaster. It's different. It's different. Hey, I liked one experience when I was just watching the roller coaster. Okay, watching it, swish, it's moving, it's going fast, you know, people are screaming, hands up, all that kind of stuff. That was the kind of knowing, that was the level of knowing I wanted to remain at, okay? But this, this you know, Methuselah or whatever, you know, <laughs> my wife of Methuselah took me to this other level here, okay? And then I knew, then I knew, I'm like, oh my, <laughs> It's fun, but it's kind of scary, you know? But, but you know, you know from experience, and it's a, different, it's a different kind of knowing, you know? You experience that thing. Here's the rub. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to be short-changed with only head knowledge of him. Well, I've heard of Jesus. Well, I heard, yeah, he rose, on, he rose in the grave. Oh, yeah, I heard, you know, hey, when I was a kid, yeah. Oh, yeah, I knew that Jesus died for our sins, and Jesus is God, he's the second person of the Trinity. I could have given you all the information. I knew it all. I had all the head knowledge of it. I, I did. I knew it all. Died for my sins, you know, rose from the grave. He, he had, there was no sin in him. He's God. I knew all the answers, but he wasn't my Lord. Where are you at in your walk with the Lord today? You know, is it just head knowledge? Or have you really entered into a deep relationship with, with Christ, man? A deep relationship with with Christ, beyond the head knowledge thing. To really know him relationally is the key. Do you know him like that? Do you know him like that? I think about this. They walked, think about this. They walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They ate. Verse 29 says that it was uh, evening or, or, or toward uh, evening at that point. All the stress of, of the three you know, days of everything that had transpired, uh, and not only that, but of the eight days leading up to um, those three days, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and everything. I mean, there was just so much activity, you know? So much going on. These guys on a long trip, trek, they're tired. But that didn't stop these guys with this news because now they trekked back seven miles. I personally think that they moved a little quicker when they were on the way back. And they had this news. Tired as they were, but man, when you've got some great news, it's amazing how you just kind of come to, it's amazing how when I'd work at the casinos, you know, I get to work and I'm, like, oh, you know, I'm exhausted all day long. I'm exhausted, you know, leading up to the, the end of shift. And it's amazing. There was something magical that happens. The moment that you just swipe that card to get out, and it's like all of a sudden you're awake. You've got energy. You're with it. And, you know, it's amazing. I can tell you what. I think these guys had so much physical energy. These guys were so awake. These guys were pumped. These guys were, in my opinion, they were moving quickly. They had some great information, and they could not wait to share the truth. They could not wait to share it. So they go back seven miles to Jerusalem. At this point, it would have been night. It's healthy when we truly get excited about the things of the Lord. Supercharged because of the Lord in our lives. In body, soul, and spirit. Many times, I've, many times I, many times you, we've lacked sleep. We haven't felt well. We've been stressed out. And what's the best thing to do? I need to seek the Lord. What's the best thing to do? I need to get fellowship. What's the best thing to do? I need to be in church. This is where I need to be when it's rough, when it's hard, when I'm tired, you know, when I got a headache, whatever. And I have found that, uh, I'll be very honest with you guys, I'm, I'm 
so serious when I say this. I have found that that is some of the best times for me. Is when I don't feel good, I'm miserable, I don't want to be here, <laughs> whatever it might be, those are the best times. Because when I plow on through it, I just find how God blesses it. Oh, he blesses it so immensely. Don't give in to your flesh. Tell your flesh. Tell your flesh what to do. Don't give in to your flesh. And it's interesting how many times, maybe a, a night of very little sleep, and yet you come, you worship the Lord, and you get in his word, and you get some good fellowship, and it's just amazing how rejuvenated you are. It really is. It's incredible to watch that happen. Now, that wouldn't happen if I was going to work wherever. But that happens when I'm in fellowship with my brothers and sisters. That's what happens. And I'm strengthened. I think many Christians lack at times the energy to do anything for the Lord because they lack the gnosko. I think many times Christians lack the energy to do anything because they lack the gnosko, the knowing through continual communion with Jesus. And they're weak. I want more. I want all that Jesus has for me. So verses 36 through 43. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why? Do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe uh, for joy, he marveled and said to them, Have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And then he took it and ate it in their presence. How cool. As they testified. Now, so they just came back. Remember, Jesus disappeared. He appeared. They realized who it was. He disappeared from their presence. They're excited. They've got the good news. They're heading back on the, you know, uh, the quick trip to, to uh, Jerusalem again, another seven miles. They can't wait to tell the disciples. They go there. They tell them what they had had heard, had seen, had experienced the testifying of Jesus, and Jesus appears to them again, and all the rest of them. That's awesome. Can you imagine if they were like, well, it's been a long day, and yeah, I, and we, we, we had this, you know, this gnosko, you know, with Jesus, uh, so to speak, but you know what? It's late. We we're walking. We're, we've been stressed, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, so I'm going to get some rest. They would have met, they would have missed out meeting, meeting the Lord there. They would have missed out that whole experience. They would have missed out testifying being a witness, they would have missed out on it all. They would have missed out on it, uh, missed out on it all. And so, man, our attitude, I believe, should be to get as much as we can get. Get as much as we can get of the Lord. You know, he's willing to give. The only holdback in our life is not the Lord, it's us. We hold back. He doesn't hold, he's not holding back. He's not holding back. We hold back. Let's not hold back any further. And he says, peace to you. Jesus brings peace to his own, but not to those who are not his. But he brings peace to his own. His peace is the greatest eternal peace that there is. It frees us from worry. So that we can say, it is well with my soul. Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1. says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. Peace with God. Through what? Through our good works. Through what? Through avoiding the Lord. Through what? Living a worldly life. Through what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have peace in your life, there is only one reason why you don't have peace in your life. And that's because you're lacking Jesus. That's the only reason. That is the only reason. Happiness is a different thing. Happiness is, is, is 
you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm happy if, you know, Kathy makes me a great meal. She makes me some fried chicken and homemade mashed potatoes and gravy. Hey, I'm a happy camper, okay? But happiness comes and goes, you know? A couple nights from now when I ask for dinner and she says, uh, fend for yourself, right? Boys used to hate that. Fend for yourself. No, not, they'd be, no, not fend for yourself, you know? Then I'm not happy. Happiness comes and goes. But joy, joy is a different thing. Joy is in the Lord. And when you're in the Lord, you have constant joy no matter what your circumstances are. Whether you got, you know, Salisbury steak TV dinner, <laughs> which I personally wouldn't eat that. That's... Salisbury steak TV dinner, or, <laughs> or, or you got some homemade fried chicken, you still have peace. You might not be happy. Kathy would probably be happier with the Salisbury steak. But you might not be, I might not be happy. But you have peace. You have peace. And that's what I'm talking about. If you don't have peace in your life, there's one reason why. Now, a spirit wouldn't appear as, as, as Jesus appeared. Jesus was glorified. He didn't uh, rise from the dead as the uh, Jehovah's Witness cult says, in spirit and without a body. That's a falsehood. It's false doctrine. It's not true. His hands and feet bore the evidence, in fact, of the crucifixion. Wow, how powerful was that? His hands and feet. Look, look, look. He gladly bore that physical evidence in his glorified body. But then again, Scripture does say that it was for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him at the cross? You and me. Verses 44 through 48 says, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I uh, was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. He opened up their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. You see, he opened up their uh, understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures because they were interested. They wanted to know. They wanted to know life. Why are we here? What's my purpose? Is there a purpose? If there is, what's that purpose? How did I get here? They wanted to know. And he said to them, this is, or, uh, thus it is written, verse 46, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses, witnesses, eyewitnesses. There's facts. There's evidence. They can testify. In a court of law, they could testify. They were witnesses. They saw. They experienced. They touched. I mean, good grief. There was over 500 witnesses, Scripture tells us. How many more? I mean, come on. Many infallible proofs we read about. Since Scripture comes from God, it can only be unlocked and understood by God. It makes sense. Since it comes from Him. Well, I don't understand Scripture. Then seek the Lord and ask for understanding. And keep on seeking Him. Seek and you will find. So you keep on seeking. It's a continual process. I guarantee you, you'll find. You will understand. God will reveal His Word to you clearly. Now, it's a lie to think that we, that we don't uh, preach, or that we shouldn't preach, I should say, uh, uh, repentance of sin. It's a lie to say that we shouldn't preach repentance of sin. We should preach repentance of sin. That's not just an Old Testament thing. That's an Old Testament and New Testament thing. Clearly, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Repentance does not come before, though, I will say, repentance does not come before true biblical faith in Jesus, nor can it. How can you repent to the Lord that you don't have in your life? How can you do anything without faith? With faith, Scripture says it's impossible to please God. So you think you repent of sin and you're going to live a good life, you're going to please God? No, you're not. But I repented of sin, so I should be pleasing to God. No, you're not, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I need faith. Well, how do I get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, it says. It's so easy. I mean, seriously, God just, just outlines it for us so simply. So clearly, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And when one truly has true saving 
faith in their lives, you begin to change. Because you can't remain the same. You don't want to remain the same. And you change for the right reasons. It's the change of the work that the Holy Spirit has done in you instead of trying to do this in your own flesh, in your own attempts. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So true faith. Most Americans would say, I believe in Jesus, but it's clear that they don't. Let's be honest. It's clear that they don't. They don't follow him. For if they did, there would be a 180-degree turn, for one thing. Repentance means a change of action and a change of course. Now, in verse 49, it said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Wow. People like, love power. I think guys kind of gravitate that even a little bit more. Love power. Physical power. Power in the workplace. Governmental power. You see them all in Washington, D.C. just vying for power. It's like you're nothing. You're nothing. It's God who puts people in places of authority and can easily remove them. doesn't matter on what side of the aisle of the political spectrum. They were endued with power, or would be endued with power from on high. Endued, in the New King James Version, which is what I read from here, by the way, the New King James Version, the King James Version, uh, we see that word endued. Uh, uh, in the New American Standard Bible, we see it as clothed. It means the same thing, to be endued, to be clothed. It, it, it's the same meaning, a different word, it's synonymous. Um, I actually prefer how uh, the synonym is here in um, uh, the New American Standard Bible. To be clothed, what? How? With what? With the Holy Spirit. You know, without clothing, we're naked, right? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're spiritually naked. Spiritually naked. Spiritually naked void spiritually without power spiritually without power now that word power here in the greek is the word dunamis it's a supernatural power it's not just any kind of power it's a supernatural power it's a power that comes from god you know we can look and there's power in the lights in this room there's power on the on the the projection on the wall there's power in the sound that comes forth from the speaker that's one kind of power but that ain't dunamis but this is the power of God. And he's saying right here, you will be clothed with the supernatural power from God. It's not of us. You can't manufacture it. You can't manufacture it. It's not of us. It's of him. And we are empowered by God to live for God. And he blesses us in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to serve him. So many gifts. I know there, there, there are those in the body here that, that have the gift of encouragement. I'm not talking about talents. There's a difference between talents and gifts. A talent can be, can be learned. Okay? A talent can be acquired. I think I have a certain talent for landscaping. I enjoy it and I've acquired it. I learned it from my dad. Okay? That's not a gift. A gift is something you didn't earn you didn't learn. You can't take any credit for it whatsoever. It's just given to you, kind of like at Christmas time, right? You didn't pay. You know, what was the last time somebody gave you a gift, a Christmas present? How much do I owe you for that? Look at you like you're crazy. You can't pay for it. You can't earn it. It's something that wasn't, yeah. It's from God. The gift from God, empowered from on high. And so we see the varying gifts in the body of Christ. Like the gift of teaching. Guys, you have no idea. Like, you know, I didn't want to teach anything to anybody. <laughs> I mean, I was the kind of guy that in any classroom, I'll sit in the back. I just wanted to be, you know, <laughs> definitely not up front here. This is the last place I ever would have wanted to be. It's not of me. Now, I'm definitely not the smartest, you know, the brightest light bulb out there either in the past. 
okay? Seriously, I'm just being honest with you, you know? <laughs> the first time I, I think it, I ever got up on a stage, I swear my knees were shaking so much that, I mean, it, it, people must have thought that there was static or something coming through the speakers, you know? It wasn't of me, it's God, the gift of teaching. So many interesting and unique gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of administration and, and so on and so forth, empowered from on high. Joel, chapter 2, verse 28, says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Or what I uh, actually, which is a, a, a very uh, clear um, uh, connection to what we're reading here in verse 49 is in Acts chapter 1 verses uh, 4 and 8. It says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for what? The promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Verse 8, but you, will, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So he said, wait for me in Jerusalem. You will be empowered from on high. You'll be empowered from the Holy Spirit. Jesus would ascend. Jesus would leave. He would send the Holy Spirit. They would be empowered for ministry. They knew him, but they, were, but they needed to be empowered for ministry. They were empowered for ministry. Well, what kind of ministry? To be witnesses of the Lord. To be witnesses of the Lord. If you're not a witness of the Lord, are you empowered? Are you empowered? I like what Warren Wiersbe says here. Witnessing is not something that we do for the Lord. It's something that he does through us. I like that. Because what can we do for God anyhow? Oh, I do this for God. I do that for God. Really? <laughs> does God need me? No. If God needed me, well, that would be a scary thing for everybody. Okay? <laughs> God doesn't need me. God doesn't need you, but he wants us. It's a difference. He sure wants us. It's not what we do for God. It's what God does through us. I love it. He wants to use us. And you know what? The people who grow the most are the people who serve the most. The people who are, who are truly connected. Those are the people that grow. Those are the people that grow. He goes on to say, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, of course. So there's a great difference between a sales talk, and a spirit-empowered witness. Big difference. People don't come to Christ at the end of an argument, said one person. Simon Peter came to Jesus because Andrew went with him, or went after him with a testimony. We go forth in the authority of his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, heralding his gospel of grace. Well put. Verses 50 through 53. And the rapture of the Lord didn't happen yet. <laughs> we got through, the, got, got through Luke. I was wondering, maybe the rapture is going to happen before we still have a couple minutes. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he led them out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. He speaks of his ascension into heaven. And he blesses them in verse 50. And they worship him in verse 52. And we see great joy. Great joy ensues. Great joy was enjoyed by them all. Praise the Lord. It's always joyous when we walk with Jesus. It's always a praise the Lord. Spend time with Jesus. Worshiping Him. And being joyous in him. Amen? Amen. 
Let's pray. Lord, I think of the song at this moment. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Oh, sweet Jesus. Sweet, sweet Jesus. No turning back for us, Lord. Mm. The sweetness that you bring into our lives truth the word says the truth will set us free oh yes lord god free yes free indeed true freedom is not found at the end of a bottle or a one night stand or building a bigger bank account true freedom is found in jesus and these men and these women, huh, they, they knew it. Gnosko. Oh, they knew it. And once you experience the most exhilarating high of all, you don't want to go back to anything else. Cheap imitations the world offers. Life is found in Jesus. Lord, we praise you this morning. Lord, we give you thanks. Oh, Lord, we love you, but it's not because we loved you first, Lord. It's because you loved us first. We seek you because you called us to, Lord God. You drew us to yourself, oh, Lord. And we've come, we've come, we've come to the table to have fellowship, relationship with the Lord, to be endued, clothed, empowered from on high, your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, I am so thankful. We are so thankful, Lord, for such love, such mercy, such grace. Grace and love, it's so amazing. So amazing indeed. Do you know the Lord? Do you have this peace, this joy? salvation in your life. There's no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved. It's by the name of Jesus. Today, would you like to receive the Lord in your life? If this is you this morning, would you just hold your hand up high saying, I, I need the Lord. I need him. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else this morning, you know, I need Jesus. I need him. I want him right now. I don't want to take another moment in this pathetic life away from him. God bless you. I see you there. Praise the Lord. Anyone else this morning? You can put your hands down. Oh, Lord. You're so good to us, Lord God. You see our hearts. You know our need for you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. For those that you rose your hand this morning, would you just pray, pray these words along with me? Just agree along with me. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want you. I need you. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe you paid for my sins. 
so that I could be set free. I believe you rose from the grave and has come to build a relationship with me. Come into my life now. For those of you that prayed that prayer this morning, know that this is the beginning of a new and the greatest journey you will ever know. It begins today and it continues in every day you follow Jesus. Scripture says that you are a new creation in Christ. It's in the past is in the past. This is a new day in the Lord. And Lord, we give you thanks. And Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, for all the rest of us, maybe we've struggled a bit this past week. Lord, forgive us of our sins, all of us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. We turn from them and we turn to you. Oh, lovely Lord. Lord, may we be empowered from on high, encouraged by your word. May we walk in faith and testify of Jesus Christ, of the good news that our God lives, that our God reigns in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen and amen.